I want to thank uh, Terrapin for asking us to speak and for all of you uh, for being here. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's going on at Advaxis. We're a very small biotech company. There are 12 of us. Uh, we're in the clinic. We've got a number of, of different vectors in development. And what we're doing, whoops, it didn't, oh, I guess the video's not playing. If it were playing, you'd see that this is a listeria infection of a cell. We are modifying a live bacteria to act as a live attenuated vaccine or active immunotherapy. Um, Listeria is uniquely suited for this purpose. Um, it has a, a broad number of biological effects, which I'll tell you about. Um, and and um, it's a ubiquitous organism. It's something that we're all exposed to. It's in everything we eat. We don't know that we routinely ingest it. Oops, this has gone back. Oh, there we go. And it has such a large number of effects that it's very different from anything that is being developed right now in that we're not looking at a specific mechanism of action. We're looking at many interrelated simultaneous mechanisms of action that have evolved over millennia to protect us from listeria on one hand and then listeria has evolved separate mechanisms to, to counteract our immune systems on the other. There is a fear of listeria because it's a potentially fatal pathogen, but it is a very rare disease. There are fewer than 800 cases in the world literature over the past 50 years or so. The risk groups are very well defined. Lateral transmission does not occur. The only way you get listeria is to eat it. And the skin is an absolute barrier. It's not aerosolized. There are three risk groups of people who get listeria disease. There are um, immunocompromised people. This is the young and the elderly, AIDS patients, transplant patients, and the like. There are people who have been exposed to processed food that has come out of factories in which there is a listeria bloom. This is the unlucky model. And they are just overdosed with an insurmountable amount of bacteria. And then there are very sick patients receiving glucocorticoids, and glucocorticoids are a known risk factor for listeria. Aside from that, normal people don't get listeria. Um, moreover, the people who do get listeria disease are not diagnosed because listeria can be eradicated by the lowest MICs of almost any common antibiotic. Tetracyclines, penicillin, Cipro, uh, Gentamicin, Bactrim, all clear listeria. So the people who get listeria disease are not diagnosed or, or treated appropriately. The first generation strain we developed, um, because we were obviously concerned with safety, was very highly attenuated and attenuated to the point where it's cleared by skid mice. So even mice that lack effective immunity can clear listeria um, and, and prevent disease. The second generation, which we're bringing to the clinic this year, uh, in this publication from 2009 we showed, is cleared by gamma knockout mice. And so the first obvious question to ask and answer with respect to listeria is can it be used safely? And the answer is yes. I'm going to touch upon a number of the things that listeria does. I feel quite certain in saying that I don't know all of the things listeria does. But one of the things that it does is that it is probably the strongest known or one of the strongest known adjuvants that exist in nature. It's an extremely strong innate immune response. But it also cross-presents. And so it is a, str and a very strong adaptive immune stimulator, stimulating both arms of the adaptive immune system, creating both CD4s and CD8s. And I'll go into a little bit of this later. But it's interesting to note that of all the things being used in the clinic right now, listeria is the only agent that induces both adaptive and innate immunity, and so you don't need GMCSF, you don't need IL-2 or an exogenous adjuvant. Listeria is its own adjuvant. There is, when you study this bug, a breakdown of what is truly innate immunity and what's truly adaptive immunity, and they do become one as you study the microorganism. Um, a novel attribute of listeria is that you get a very profound effector 
uh, memory, uh, central memory also, consolidating within hours. Uh, Listeria generates a very persistent, very immediate immune memory, and we use that fact because it allows us to give antibiotics to clear the bug without abrogating the immune memory in the therapeutic response. Listeria alters the tumor microenvironment. We've published four times on a diminution of regulatory T cells in various models, including HPV, HER2, PSA, and other models. And we've recently published to show that Listeria will result in a decrease in MDSCs, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and effects on those that persist. Listeria has a very profound effect on the local disease environment. Interestingly, when Listeria infects cells, those cells get attacked by the immune system and they're killed pretty quickly. It is the bystander cells that do a lot of the immune stimulation. Listeria has the ability to release reactive oxygen intermediates from infected cells, which feed back upon adjacent epithelial and other kinds of cells, causing the bystander cells to release large amounts of cytokines and chemokines. So there's a lot of, of indirect effects here. Listeria will stimulate the marrow. It causes the development of an increased number of myeloid precursors. It shifts myelo meta uh, marrow metabolism to make more immune cells. It also causes immune reserves in peripheral parts of the body to become activated and to become terminally differentiated effector cells, the Kupfer cells in the, in the liver, the spleen cells, and various cells in nodes. So Listeria has the effect not only of stimulating an immune, an, innate and an adaptive immune response, but it also increases the level of immune surveillance by causing the activation of immature immune cells and shifting marrow metabolism to make more immune cells. It stimulates chemotaxis and the extravasation of activated cells from the blood and into tissues. I talked about some of the uh, intertumoral effects. There are many more to talk about. Listeria induces epitope spreading so that if you direct a vaccine at antigen B, you can, in fact, stimulate immune responses against antigen C, D, E, and F. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And listeria is a purely cellular immune response. There are no antibodies. Some of the vaccine technologies that have been tried have been opsonized in the blood and rendered inactive before they could affect uh, a therapeutic outcome. That's not the case with listeria. So while this is a really busy slide, the point I really want to make is there's a lot going on here, and it's not just one thing. I'm not going to go into all of this other than to say that because of its food pathogenicity, listeria is probably the most well-studied immune stimulating agent that we have. It is the basis for a lot of research. It has been used as a tool to tease apart the, the cellular immune system, and everybody knows that listeria has profound cellular immune effects. These are some of the innate immune effects that have been found to be associated with listeria. It strikes me that the name of the game is pattern recognition and changes in the local tissue environment in response to changing patterns. And that's what listeria does very well. It, it influences the pattern recognition pathogen-associated patterns, danger-associated patterns within the local tissue milieu and enables the tissue milieu to respond very quickly. Listeria is ordinarily phagocytosed. 90% plus is broken down in the phagolysosome. It stimulates CD4 cell, goes into a class two, type two mechanism, stimulates CD4 cells. Listeria secretes an enzyme called listeriolysin O, which is a hemolytic enzyme that enables it to get out of the lysosome where it becomes virulent, it replicates in the cytosol, gets into an MHC1 pathway, and its secretory products go into an MHC1 pathway and stimulate killer T cells. So it has various mechanisms of action. This occurs within antigen-presenting cells. Listeria infects DCs and macrophages, mast cells, and a whole bunch of other cell types. The, we use LLO. It's a very profound adjuvant. And we bioengineer listeria first to be attenuated, as I've mentioned, but second to secrete an antigen fused to LLO. So it's an antigen adjuvant protein that the microbe is synthesizing and secreting. And you can see here that when you look at the E7 
vaccine alone that secretes the naked antigen and compare it with the one below in blue that secretes the LLOE7 fusion protein, there is a profound effect both on uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes to increase those and to decrease regulatory T cells. And the ratio in the last column is changed significantly. Early on when we began looking at this using an HPV model, we saw very profound effects in the tumor. You can see the effects of stimulating with E7, with a detoxified LLO, with a detoxified LLO plus E7, or with the fusion protein that we bioengineer into the bug. And you can see the difference between the spleen and the tumor. The effects that listeria has are focused primarily on sites of disease. Very little occurs in the spleen, a lot occurs in the tumor. Uh, we first published about a decrease in Tregs in 2004. Uh, here you can see the differential effects of a vaccine that just secretes E7, LME7 versus LMLLOE7, which secretes the fusion protein. Uh, the effects are very dramatic in the tumor, and you can see that it also diminishes uh, the type 2 cytokines associated with T regulatory cells, uh, TGF beta and IL10. This is something we just published at the last ASCO meeting in Florida, not ASCO, AACR. Um, what we see with Tregs, the slide on the bottom right, is both specific and nonspecific effects. We clearly see an adjuvant effect of listeria to decrease Tregs, but we see a much more increased effect when we use the appropriate antigen for the tumor model. Um, and in the graph above that, you can see a similar effect on myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So it appears as though listeria has the ability to diminish both Tregs and MDSCs, and, and according to Dr. Gabrilovich recently, uh, tumor-associated macrophages are basically grown-up MDSCs, and so it may be we may have an effect on all of the cell types that inhibit the immune system within tumors. If you then look at the MDSCs that persist after listeria treatment, what you see is that the blue line are naive, uh, naive lymphocytes added to an MDSC culture, and you can see that they're suppressed. Every replication, second generation, third replication, there are fewer and fewer T cells. However, if you look at the, um, the reddish line, which are animals treated with our listeria vaccine, you can see there is less suppression of the MDSCs as a function of listeria treatment. And this occurs after the numbers of MDSCs are, are uh, reduced. We see this in tumors, we don't see it in spleen, we don't see it in draining nodes. It's another tumor-specific effect. Listeria gets into tumors, it gets in because it can get through the membranes when we give it IV, but mainly it gets in because it's carried in by infected macrophages and other DCs. Going through some in vivo data, this is a model we've used a lot. These are transgenic and normal animals with uh, WT1, uh, uh, excuse me, TC1 tumors, HPV tumors. They're dosed on day seven and day 14. The solid symbols are the control animals and they progress rapidly. Most animals become tumor-free very shortly, including roughly half the transgenic animals. And if you take the animals who are tumor-free and you re-inoculate them, with tumor cells, they do not grow tumors again. This is the same thing in an HPV model, excuse me, in a HER2 model. Uh, HER2 was too big to put in listeria. We broke it up into five different fragments. We made five different vaccines. All of them worked. Internal epitopes worked. External epitopes worked. This was a big surprise to us. We then took all of these different effective class one epitopes, cut them apart, put them back together again in a chimeric antigen, made a vaccine directed against that chimeric antigen, and tested a couple of those chimeric vaccines in the clinic. What we found here, we published a couple of years ago, is that in a transgenic HER2 model, uh, what you can see in the blue the, with the blue triangles is that over a 52-week observation period, roughly 30% of these transgenic animals never develop tumors. Uh, and I don't think anybody else has reported that to date. This vaccine has, this is a pulmonary metastasis model. You can see the difference between experimental controls in lung mets. This is a CNS model, which we gave HER2 uh, containing tumor in the brain. You can see that an IP peripheral injection 
of the vaccine, actually two va uh, injections of the vaccine, uh, had a protective effect uh, in central nervous system. This is some radio data coming out of uh, Montefiore. We'll be hopefully developing this with the uh, RTOG, the Radiotherapy Oncology Group. The upper two lines are controls. They're naive controls as well as uh, a positive control with an irrelevant vaccine. The middle two lines are radiotherapy alone or vaccine alone, and they both work somewhat. The dashed line is the putative added effect. If you were to take the two middle lines and add the efficacy together, and the bottom is what we see when we add the vaccine and the immunotherapy, uh, excuse me, and the radiotherapy together. And this is something that, as I said, this, this vaccine will hopefully be in the clinic by the end of the year, and we'll be working on this with some of the collaborative groups at NCI. I had talked about epitope spreading. This is a model in which we gave a vaccine directed against, two vaccines actually, directed against either the E1 or external fragment or I1 internal fragment of something called FLK. FLK is VEGF receptor protein 2. So this is a, uh, a VEGF model. We gave HER2 containing tumors. We looked at, we gave the, uh, the uh, anti-angiogenic vaccine, but we looked at the response to HER2. And we saw that by giving a listeria vaccine directed against FLK, we generated an active immune response against HER2. And then when we looked in the tumors, we saw that both in wild type and in transgenic animals, these tumors, these uh, T cells to, to HER2 that were stimulated by the FLK vaccine were in fact migrating into the tumors and appeared to be efficacious. So, and we've shown this, by the way, with another tumor model as well, uh, actually a ubiquitin-related antigen. Uh, and so it seems pretty convincing to us that you get epitope spreading with live listeria vaccines. We've been able to break the cold chain. This is a dried formulation. By the way, I should mention that this is a live replication competent bacteria. So when you make the vector, when you have an attenuated bug that secretes the antigen adjuvant infusion protein and you're ready to take it to the clinic, this is a bug that replicates. So if you, if you have a culture medium, you can make more bug. Um, it's very inexpensive to make, and now that we figured out how to dry it, it's very distributable. So it has a lot of attributes. Um, I talked about the speed with which memory formation occurs in Listeria. This is some work that goes to that. And what you can see on the right-hand group of, of, of graphs are uh, T-cell curves, T-cell expansion and contraction curves, when animals either were or were not given antibiotic at 24 hours. And you can see there's no difference. T cells expand and contract at approximately the same rate whether animals were given antibiotic on, at 24 hours or not. Um, in the graph on the right, it shows some of our data in which we can show that an HPV vaccine will knock down tumors and the control naive animals will not have an effect, but it doesn't matter in terms of the tumor response, whether you give uh, ampicillin at days three, four, five, five, six, seven, or seven, eight, nine. And so we routinely give antibiotic. I don't know that we need to, but it's prudent to do so, and certainly the regulators feel more comfortable with it. Um, after every dose of listeria, we give the antibiotic. In all probability, it's not needed, but that's where we are today. The first phase one study that we did was in cervix cancer patients who had failed uh, cytotoxic therapy. These are women who have a median survival of six months from the time their disease progresses. Uh, the one-year survival in this population is 5%. They tend to be platinum tolerant. They've had surgery. They've had radio. They've had a couple of courses of chemo. And, um, and nothing else works. In the phase one study, we treated uh, three groups of five patients each with different doses. Patients are skin tested to make sure they're not allergic. We certainly don't want to hurt them with the bug, and there's really no point in giving an immunotherapy if you can't, don't have an immune response. Um, and as I said, in this study, we gave ampicillin five days after each dose. We're now giving it 72 hours after each dose. All patients had a cytokine storm, fever, chills, headache, nausea, vomiting, myalgia, everything you would expect. Um, in all patients at all doses. In the third cohort, 
we raised the temperature sufficiently that we began to see cardiovascular uh, compensation for high temperature, and so we saw uh, decreased diastolic pressures, we saw changes in heart rate. Um, a grade two hypotension was the dose limiting toxicity in this study, and we stopped when fluids were needed. Uh, it should be noted that there were no infectious disease complications. All of the adverse events were dealt with symptomatically, um, NSAIDs for fever, uh, antihistamines for nausea, that kind of thing. Um, and the drug was safe and well tolerated. Uh, what you'll see here is uh, progression, stability, and, and a PR. Of the 15 treated patients, 13 were stable. Um, excuse me, 13 were evaluable, seven were stable. The bottom three stable patients actually had a 20% tumor reduction. Uh, the PR had a 32% tumor reduction. Um, this is what got GOG's attention, and so now they're collaborating with us. We've got a, a gynecologic oncology group study that's about to start up. Um, survival, we lost track of these patients the beginning of this year. Um, they were not reported as dead, and their physicians had no information on them, but we couldn't find these women, we couldn't find their, their husbands or their children when we tried to do follow-up. But you'll see that we have two patients who are at least four years plus out of the initial 15 treated. The median survival in this study went from a, a historical 180 days to a 347 days in, in our hands, and the one-year survival uh, went from 5% historically to 50%, 53% in the phase one study. And so uh, this was unexpected efficacy. I, I had looked at this actually as a very debilitated patient population to be able to make a strong safety statement in, I was surprised by the efficacy. Um, the patient who was a PR did so well that they gave her additional chemotherapy. Now this, this is a woman who had already failed radiotherapy and failed two courses of chemotherapy. There was no reason to believe that additional chemotherapy would be useful. Uh, historically, it's not. In this particular case, she responded. She became a, a CR with all labs within normal limits and a performance status of 100%. Uh, and she persisted that way for well over a year before her disease recurred. Uh, currently, we've got four trials going on in the clinic. There is a, a cervix cancer go trial going on in India, much like our phase one study. Uh, there is a SIN trial, uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which most of us call cervical dysplasia. And that's a multicenter trial going on in the U.S., and we're paying for both of those. But we've been very fortunate in being able to attract uh, collaborators who have helped us with the clinical program. Uh, the NIH and the gynecologic oncology group is starting up a cervix cancer trial in the U.S., a multicenter trial that will be going on at, at a lot of institutions. Um, and CRUK, the British philanthropy that, uh, that funds cancer research, has funded a trial in oropharyngeal head and neck, that head and neck cancer due to HPV. And that should be starting um, shortly. We're shipping drug for that now. Um, we're also doing a veterinary study utilizing our HER2 construct on osteosarcoma in large dogs. It's a very interesting model because it's a companion animal model. It's a clinical trial of dogs who live at home and live in our homes and live with us and eat similar kinds of foods to us and um, are being treated as clinical trials patients. So very relevant to what we're doing in, uh, with HER2 and osteo. Um, the PSA and the uh, HER2 vaccines are being made under GMP conditions right now. We're doing the toxicology for INDs, and we hope to have them in the clinic by the end of this year. Um, we have an additional, I don't know if I have it, no I don't. We have an additional roughly 12 vaccines in various stages of development, including carbonic anhydrase 9 and WT1, surviving telomerase, and a whole bunch of others. Um, we're also developing the antigen adjuvant peptide as a peptide vaccine independent of listeria. Um, this is a, a, a real overlooked area, in my opinion, of immunology. I mean, we all believe in immunology because we know what it can do in infectious disease. And in fact, it does that with listeria. And, and by, by making antigens look like they come from listeria, uh, we've been very successful so far. So thank you very much.